Hey guys, Tyler here. One Star Trek species that I've been dying to talk about on this channel is the Andorians, a founding member of the Federation first introduced in the original series episode Journey to Babel and subsequently featured in dozens of Star Trek episodes. The Andorians' blue skin, antennae, and other distinct features make them one of the more intriguing Star Trek aliens from a pure design perspective. In this video, I'll examine their biology, as well as their unique history and culture, and compare them to what we expect aliens to be like in real life. Let's get started. In addition to being blue-skinned, Andorians have blue blood that may be based on the protein hemocyanin instead of hemoglobin. Hemocyanin is found in some earth animals, such as horseshoe crabs, and it's more efficient at oxygen transport than hemoglobin in colder and lower pressure environments. Andorians also possess white or silver hair and have a higher metabolic rate than humans, all adaptations to the icy climate of their homeworld. Indeed, as Shran remarks in an episode of Enterprise, while Andorians can become accustomed to a variety of conditions, they are best suited for frigid temperatures. Another one of the Andorians' most distinctive features, their antennae, serve a number of purposes. They primarily aid in balance, although they may also aid in other senses, like seeing, hearing, and touch. If an antenna is lost, an Andorian can become partially disabled in the short term, although they would start to compensate within days. Antennae usually grow back within nine months if left untreated, but can grow back in half that time with the use of electrical stimulation and cranial massage. While losing an antenna is not considered critical, it can be humiliating. As for how such a feature would evolve in an otherwise seemingly mammalian species, well, I'll get to that, but first, we need to talk about the Andorian homeworld. The Andorian homeworld, Andoria, is actually a moon orbiting a gas giant called Andor, not to be confused with Endor. The star this moon and gas giant orbit is called Procyon, or Alpha Canis Minoris. Procyon was identified with the Andorian system years ago in the non-canon reference book Star Trek Star Charts, as well as later in Stellar Cartography, the Starfleet reference library. And the star was confirmed in canon to be Andoria's primary by maps used in Discovery and Picard. Procyon, which is 11 light years away, is a binary star that consists of a whitish F-type primary and a faint white dwarf companion. An F-type star's habitable zone, or the region around a star where life could develop, is estimated to extend from about 1.1 astronomical units, or AUs, to about 3.7 AUs. But while the star is hotter and larger, both in terms of mass and radius, Andor's distance from Procyon probably is much further than Earth's relative distance from the Sun. Some Star Trek sources have the gas giant being the fifth or eighth planet orbiting Procyon, probably several AUs further away. Here, Andoria would be heated largely due to tidal effects of the gas giant's gravity well. Now, this may sound too good to be true, but guess what? That actually happens right here in our solar system. We can see this force at work with some of the moons of the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. Here's how it works. A gas giant's gravitational energy produces tidal forces that tug at a moon that's in a slightly elliptical orbit. This tidal bulge varies over the course of the orbit, generating internal friction that heats the moon's interior. This is what's responsible for volcanic activity on Jupiter's moon Io, and the same effect helps heat the subsurface oceans of one of Jupiter's other moons, Europa, and Saturn's moon Enceladus. You may recall that Europa, Enceladus, and a few other moons in our solar system are prime candidates for the search for extraterrestrial life in their subsurface oceans. These moons are believed to have hydrothermal vents under their ice layers, and some of the earliest fossilized life on Earth exists around similar hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. In other star systems, though, some moons of gas giants may garner enough mass to hold on to an oxygen atmosphere and produce other conditions suitable for life on the surface. Speaking of life on the surface, a 
planet in an F star's habitable zone would be subject to between two and a half and 7.1 times the amount of UV radiation that Earth receives. Even with sufficient atmospheric shielding like an ozone layer, there would still be enough UV radiation coming through to affect the coloration of pigments in native flora and fauna. As I talked about in my video about the Asari from Mass Effect, such pigments in alien life could reflect higher energy blue light while absorbing other colors. But when it comes to Andorians, given the greater distance of their homeworld from their star, their appearance may actually be the result of their blue blood pulling closer to the surface of their skin to keep them warm. Indeed, the Andorians may have partially evolved underground possibly from mole-like creatures. We know they built subsurface cities to take advantage of geothermal energy, uh, so it's not that far of a stretch. One other fact about Procyon, the system is actually less than two billion years old. This makes some sense from a statistical point of view, given that F stars burn through their hydrogen more quickly. So it follows that most of the ones that we'd encounter uh, would be younger than our sun. Why is this worthy of discussion? Well, it could have some implications about the history of Andorian evolution. As we learn in the Next Generation episode, The Chase, most if not all humanoid life in the galaxy is descended from a genetic code seeded by the progenitors four and a half billion years ago. When it comes to star systems younger than four and a half billion years, while many of them have undoubtedly been colonized by non-native species, some of the progenitors' DNA sequence could have drifted through space and landed on the surface of younger planets in a process called panspermia. Some scientists hypothesize this is how life actually got started here on Earth. Bacteria and other microorganisms that traveled the cosmos would have landed on Earth via comet impact or possibly from Mars or outside the solar system. As for Andorians, given how fine-tuned their evolution seems to be for their environment, and given what we know about Andorian prehistory, I think it's fair to say that they are native to their homeworld. They did evolve there. The coded DNA fragments that gave rise to life on Andoria could have been seeded later by another ancient race like the Preservers, who are not the same as the progenitors as I discussed in one of my other videos. Or these fragments could have been transported there naturally via a mechanism like the mycelial network. The mycelial network. Like Mycelial network! That's, that's the Star Trek reference! The Andorians are described and portrayed as a militaristic race. They carry weapons without stun settings, and it's considered an honor to serve in their Imperial Guard. Military rank greatly influences social reputation. They are considered by outsiders, and even themselves, to be deeply emotional, passionate, and violent. Andorians are even taught how to fight with various weapons during childhood, so yeah pretty Sparta-like. Lest you think that these cultural practices would make the Andorians an overall conservative species, well, arguably you'd be right. But they do have some progressive elements. Women enjoy an equal position in Andorian society and are considered just as capable as males in combat. Also, as shown in Enterprise, women can initiate an intimate relationship by assaulting a male. Yeah. When it comes to gender, though, the Andorians are actually rather unique among Star Trek aliens. According to data, Andorian marriages usually require groups of four people, except under certain circumstances. Now, while this could simply be a case of regular old polygamy, some novels and other sources have uh, taken this to mean that Andorians actually have four sexes, which makes their reproduction habits complicated. Whether or not Andorians are four-sexed is still up for debate, but it's never been commented on in canon, and their on-screen depictions have never really made further distinctions than just male and female. However, the Lower Decks character Jennifer Shireon's second name follows the four-gender Andorian naming convention established in the novels, indicating that she is a Shin, a sex that provides one-third of the gametes for the offspring. Okay, you know what? Even though it's not canon, we, we have got to explore this a little more deeply. As established in the DS9 novel Avatar Book 2, the four Andorian sexes 
are as follows. Shin is a sex that roughly corresponds to female and produces an egg containing one-third of the necessary chromosomes. Than is a sex that roughly corresponds to male and fertilizes the Shin's egg with his gamete containing another third of the necessary chromosomes. Chan is another sex that roughly corresponds to male who fertilizes the egg again with his third of the chromosomes. Chans usually have a wiry body type and are smaller than Thans, who are usually bigger and more muscular. Finally, the Jin is the other sex that roughly corresponds to female and carries the zygote term in a pouch. They thus do not contribute genetically to the offspring. The writers and editors at Pocket Books, which publishes many Star Trek novels, have freely admitted that this is simply just one interpretation of Data's line but it afforded more storytelling opportunities. Animals with chromosomes besides the familiar X and Y do exist here on Earth. For example, there are animals with W and Z chromosomes. But while there are definitely intersex humans, the Andorians' alleged four sex reproductive practices are rather alien. So, to recap. Andorian's possibly hemocyanin-based blood is more efficient at oxygen transport than hemoglobin. Their antennae aid in balance and give them enhanced perception of their environment, and their culture promotes being skilled in combat. On the other hand, their inclination towards colder temperatures may limit their placement on human-dominated Starfleet vessels. Their higher metabolism makes them easier to tire out, and their supposed forced-sexed biology limits the scale of their reproduction. All in all, they're pretty evenly balanced as far as their strengths and weaknesses. So, if you were a Starfleet captain, would you recruit an Andorian to serve on your crew? Why or why not? I'll be interested to hear your responses. Andorians are one of the most fascinating Star Trek species to me personally. I mean, after all we just went through, how could they not be? Well, I certainly didn't include every single fact about Andorians in this video, my hope is that this has been an interesting overview of their biology, history, society, and culture. But what do you think? Let me know down in the comments. With that said, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are also in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Thank you.